Good afternoon. My name is Ellen Stedfeld, and I'm the Alumni Program Director for DAP, and I'm excited to welcome you to our fifth annual DAPX. DAPX was developed in 2018 by the DAP Alumni Council and the UC Alumni Association to highlight the interesting and impactful work our amazing alumni do across a number of creative disciplines. So similar to last year's program, DAPX this year is hybrid, which means I'm seeing about half the audience here on campus in the auditorium. Welcome everyone. But I know that there's a number of people who are signing on virtually from all across the country. So if you are one of our virtual guests, feel free to pop in the chat where you're tuning in from so we can get a sense of, of where everyone is, is joining us. So thank you everyone in person or online for joining us today. So um, I appreciate your support and without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to the Dean Timothy Jokna. Thank you, Ellen, and welcome everybody, both in person and online. That, that includes alumni, but also um, emeriti coming from the emeritus luncheon that we just concluded. I'm glad, happy to see some colleagues and some students here as well, and as well as others from the broader community. So welcome, one and all. And DAPEX is a really important landmark in, the, in our calendar, in DAP's calendar. For me, alumni are a, a really important part of the DAP family. I mean, when, when I'm going out there telling people how transformative and forward-looking DAP is, I point to the alumni. The alumni are our best advocates. They are our best ambassadors. They are the best role models for our students. They are the best examples that we can look to. And I think that bringing a curated group of presentations like this together once a year really helps to solidify that. Um, today we will have pres presenters both in person and online coming from six different states as well as one who will be joining us from Singapore. Um, and if past years are any indication, I think we're going to be treated to a really, really wide variety of presentations that on the one hand, we'll show you all of the exciting and sometimes unexpected places that a DAP degree can take you as an individual, and also the different ways in which our alumni out there in the community are making a real impact on people's lives and on issues and on the, and society at large. Um, this, by the way, I would be remiss in not acknowledging that this is already our 100th year of doing this. This is the 100th year, the centennial of our college. Um, you may have seen some of our distinguished alumni being featured on uh, our social media streams. You may have been contacted or come in contact with our um, scholarship program, the Next 100 Scholarship Drive, where we are seeking to get scholarships to support the next 100 um, students, so looking be both backward in, into our history and then anticipating who are going to be the next 100 who will be sharing the stage. Um, so without further ado, I will turn this over to your MC for the day, Brian Trainer. Hello, everyone. Um, I look to Dean Jockna, thank you for that introduction, to up my shirt game every year. So we're getting there. I'm almost there. Every year he pushes it a little bit further, but we're trying. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm Brian Trainer, a DAP alumnus, a lover of hosting, podcasts, post-it notes, and an award-winning race car driver. Um, I was a part of the inaugural DAPX in 2019, and I'm thrilled to be back to introduce our speakers and to help keep the day moving along. I'm even more delighted to experience DAPEX with you, both online and in person. And as the Dean said, our very first one is from Singapore, and that's what this hybrid experience gives us the benefit of. So, so much work, uh, so much of the work that uh, DAP alumni do has a profound impact on the human experience. And DAPEX is our opportunities to celebrate our collective accomplishments. All of these presentations were self-submitted last October as part of the annual RFP process, and we're super excited to learn more about each. 
To lay the groundwork, we'll have five presentations back to back. We're going to take a short break and then a second set of five presentations uh, before the morning concludes. If you're joining us online, you'll notice a little chat box uh, to the side of the stream. Use it if, if we've got it working. I know, uh, Ellen was working on that. If you're a UC alum, share your grad year and where you're watching from and react to presenters in real time with the fellow attendees. Thank you to everyone for being with us today, and let's get started. Uh, first up is Tim Hammonds, BSDE 1989, uh, Visual Storytelling to Spark in Social Innovation. Tim Hammonds is a visual facilitator, coach, and trainer, maybe we're cousins, with over 20 years of experience drawing, speaking, training with clients throughout Asia and the world. Tim is passionate about creative transformation. As a visual facilitator and coach, he helps teams to articulate and visualize strategy, map solutions, and create, connect, and collaborate better with a marker in their hands. He has worked with a wide range of organizations and industries to create narratives and metaphors for environment, or, whoop, yeah, for environment with the right tools. Oh, no, I skipped some. I apologize, Tim. Create narratives. I'm doing a great job. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Create narratives and metaphors for change. Articulate branding strategy and catalyze teams. Tim believes that creating the right environment with the right tools is half the battle won towards effective positive change. Visual tools and models create environments that encourage collaborative problem solving, bigger picture thinking, and collective ownership of the results. As a speaker and trainer, he uses live sketching in his presentations to frame key messages, build interactive storytelling, and boost curiosity, engagement, and take away value through the roof. An American citizen, Tim has lived and worked in Singapore since 1991. Together with his wife, Irene, they set up Art of Awakening in 2011 to transform meetings and conversations through interactive visual storytelling. Tim, take us away. Hey, thank you. Thank you for that warm and welcoming uh, introduction. <laughs> so I'm in Singapore. It's uh, the other side of the world. Literally, if you're holding a globe, you spin your finger, uh, balancing on Cincinnati, you put the other finger down to keep it a balance while you're spinning. And that's pretty close to where Singapore is, right? 12 hours away. Uh, it's the middle of the night here. But I feel really lucky, blessed, and so you know, connected to be back here with you in Cincinnati for this time. In 1989, we were all about um, drawing ideas, right? In the graphic design, visual communication was my, um, yeah, visual, visual communication design was, was our, our work then. Uh, the biggest thing happening in that year was the, the Tiananmen Square um, um, student revolt in Beijing was kind of something on, on our map. But what we're going to talk about is visual storytelling to spark social innovation and to look at a case study of some of the work that I've done and the power of, of creating a safe space, a safe container for ideas to emerge uh, through dialogue, through rich dialogue, through listening and sketching. So that's how it comes back to what we're doing here. So just as a quick kind of... Um, introduction yeah let me uh yeah so we're gonna share some stories and around the campfire and a campfire is a place for connection and stories and in the work that we do this this live visual drawing that we bring into you know conferences and into any kind of uh, journey or transformation journey uh any kind of meeting ideation session people gather around the visuals to tell their story and to the stories anchor the wisdom and the richness. So that's kind of the, the metaphor that I like to think of when we're doing this work, this visual facilitation work. Um, there's just a li little quick, you know, bit about me, our company, Art of Awakening. We do visual facilitation, visual training, um, sketch noting conferences. But the program I want to talk about, it's called United in Diversity. It's Ideas Indonesia. Um, let me just pause here. And I'm going to make a little bit of an introduction in terms of a drawing. So I'm going to go back here to this drawing. So um, maybe you've ever, ha have you ever had a time when you felt like a perfectionist? Have you ever, anybody struggled with perfectionism? <laughs> Visual designers, uh, communication designers, 
DAP graduates perfectionism, right? I found that a key to creating change, one of the, the biggest keys to creating change is through story. And one of the ways to support story is through visuals and drawing. Yeah. And um, research shows that we, people are more engaged by and connected by something that is iterative and sketchy than by something that is finished or complete. That's why a live drawing will be always more powerful than a PowerPoint slide, for example. And I became, I kind of fell in love with the, with, you know, the, the, the process of sketching. So I'll just share a, a little, little quick introduction. In, um, I had an internship at Landor Associates and one of my designs that looked a little bit like this was chosen for the final visual for Toyota, Toyota Motors logo. And of course their, their logo ended up looking something like that. But my idea was selected as a global international finalist with, with Landor Associates back in around 1989. So that was exciting. But one thing we did in the context of that work with Landor is that, you know, we would go bring a client into a room and it's filled with hundreds of sketches and, you know, present the client with those hundreds of sketches that go across a scale of different ideas. And, but what I always enjoy more than finding one idea was the process. And the process always involved thinking, and drawing. <laughs> I need a marker. Yeah. Thinking and drawing. And so that's what I began to, to, to love that. And as I did this work, I then came in, was, was doing teaching here in Singapore at a design school as well. And, you know, I discovered some things. There was, there was a time when students came and said, Hey teacher, I don't know, you know, my parents tell me I should study something that's going to help me to get a real job. And there's this stress. Right. And I would end up coaching them around, you know, this, this disconnection between the head and the heart. Has anyone ever felt that disconnection, that gap between the head and the heart? This has been said that the greatest, uh, the longest 18 inches on earth is the gap between the head and the heart, between what I think and what I feel. <laughs> yeah. So I began coaching them, but I, but I realized as we were doing that, coming back to what I learned about sketching and process to help us see and organize our thinking, I realized that we can do something. And that's where I started our company, right? Art of Awakening to look at passion, purpose, and possibility. Yeah. And then coming back to, to the um, ideas, Indonesia here. I just want to show this for a moment. Yeah. Here is our, our kind of a case study, the ideas Indonesia. Um, this one? Yeah. So this is a joint venture between University of Indonesia and MIT in Boston. And maybe some of you might be familiar with the, the work of Otto Scharmer and what he calls the theory U, that the, that the way to create long-term systemic change is not through a straight line, but through the U theory. And it's something like what you see there. But the context of this was in, in Indonesia where it's working with the, the tri-sector of the government and business and civil service or, or NGOs where none of them talk to each other. They have conflicting interests. There's systemic, you know, corruption and, um, you know, a vast archipelago where a lot of things are happening that nobody wants to talk about. So, and he talks about three divides, the ecological and social and spiritual divide. And in short, right, ecological is meaning we're consuming resources on the planet at a, at a rate of 1.75% of our ability to replenish them, right? The land, uh, the resources, water, and so on. Social divide, spiritual divide. We're collectively creating results that nobody wants. So that's the challenge is to go from ego of results to eco is, is about con uh, connection in the world. So, and so we are doing these visual work, right? This visual facilitation, drawing that out. And there was a time when, you know, there's, there's the theory you just to anchor that, but just to sort of look at what, what we were doing is I like to look at the work we're creating is, is around creating a safe container and a safe container means a space of listening, a space of being heard, a space of validating my ideas, my needs, my challenges. And so this is, 
and, and then the visual work also supported that safe container. So that's kind of the context that we're working with. And I'm just going to share a story about how we did that. So part of the work is the drawing, but another part of the work is creating these, these 3D mapping and using the wisdom of your hands to sort of create a model of our current situation in, a, in, a, in an organization or in a systemic um, kind of relationship or maybe what's the problem with overfishing, you know, in certain parts of Indonesia or indigenous um, people that are marginalized. And they would create these maps that you see there to represent those, those realities in three dimension. And while they're doing that and we're, we're sketching that out and mapping out their stories, they would then talk about what's going on. And some of them said they felt so connected, more connected with these individuals because of the container that's created more connected than they feel with their own family. So they're able to, to share their ideas. They're able to open up, you know, be vulnerable and talk to each other in a way that they've never been able to talk to, you know, the different, um, different government, different uh, business um, representatives in the room. But they're there all with one connection. They're passionate about change and they're passionate about their country, Indonesia. So we're doing this work, mapping it and sketching it. And I remember one specific story where, you know, the, the owner of one of Indonesia's um, oldest or biggest mines. Yeah. He said, I want to change, but I don't know how to do it. Right. He says, he says, my, my country, my company of mining, we're raping the earth. We're taking away all these resources, but I don't know what to do. Right. I my hands are tied and he was almost on the verge of tears. Right. And then another individual said that, that has connections in media says, I can bring in media. We can help to tell your story. We can bring some awareness to that, right? And then someone else you know, came in and chimed in and said, I know what I can do. I have another you know, connection that can help find a way out of this solution. So right there in the room, and this is why this, this case study for me in, in doing this work of over you know, 12 years and being in over 800 meetings and sketching in every one of them, this is, one, this is the, perhaps the most um, powerful application of, of this work that I've seen. So I felt in that moment that change was happening. So the invitation that I might share, I mean, these are just some other examples of the work here, um, you know, from those, those, those programs, you know, it's about the, the opportunity of using live sketching, uh, focusing on the process over the product and creating space through your sketching to hold ideas, you know, listening and organizing and validation, right? Here's just some other examples of that. Here's then, you know, after doing this, this, this work that we're doing, we're then facilitating an opportunity for individuals to create a vision of their future through simple imagery um, at the table there. And here's, here's some of these drawings. This is from 2013 in, in Indonesia. These are simple drawings, but, but the feedback was that these drawings created validation they created a sense of uh, we're being heard and, uh, you know, the power of those pictures to help anchor their stories. And there's just come a, a couple of other thoughts. So um, just one, one thought to leave you with is to keep drawing, stay curious and tell your stories. That's my, my son there, Zeleg, who's now seven years old. That's his whiteboard. <laughs> we're drawing all the time, you know, in our place here. And then he's drawing. So if you have kids, you watch how they're drawing. They're not focused on the drawing as a thing. It's drawing as an extension of my world, their, their, their way of, of thinking and the process and storytelling. So be more childlike <laughs> and find ways to create value through your listening and your drawing. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> I think we kept to our time. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. I don't know how you managed to uh, summon that much energy at one in the morning, but glory in your spunk. For <laughs> Thank you for that. And you talk about the disconnect between the, the head and the heart. I often follow my heart and hope my head can catch up. So I'm right there with you. But I like that. Stay childlike. So thank you, Tim, very much for being part of this. Um, next up, we have a what? You're welcome. <laughs> also, if you see a very tall a uh, guy with a Tennessee drawl and a very pale skin, um, and his name is Jeff. That's my cousin. He's in Indonesia as well. So <laughs> just tell him Cousin Brian says hi. He'll understand. 
<laughs> but thank you. Next up, we have Wade Johnston, I believe, who's with us in the room. Uh, 2013 BUP on Building the Crown. Wade Johnston, AICP, is the director of Tri-State Trails. An avid commuter cyclist and outdoor enthusiast, Wade is working to change people's everyday interaction with the built environment and the outdoors in greater Cincinnati. Under Wade's leadership, Tri-State Trails has grown from a grassroots coalition to the leading advocacy organization for active transportation issues in the Tri-State region. One of Tri-State Trails' noteworthy accomplishments has been galvanizing a diverse public-private partnership for the Crown Capital Campaign, which has raised $11 million in public funds and $10 million in private funds to build out a 34-mile urban trail loop around Cincinnati. Uh, is Wade? There you are. Hello. Welcome, Wade. Wade Johnson, you have his name. Hi, everybody. I'm Wade Johnston. I'm the executive director of Tri-State Trails. Tri-State Trails is a nonprofit organization working to connect and expand the trail and bikeway network around greater Cincinnati. One of the projects we've been leading since 2015 is The Crown, uh, what I'm here to talk to you about today, which is a vision for a 34-mile urban trail loop around greater Cincinnati. Can you imagine a Cincinnati where more people walk, ride a bike, or take the bus than drive? What would our city look like? What would our neighborhoods look like? What would our people look like? Cincinnati was originally built at a pedestrian scale. From 1830 to 1900, we were one of the top 10 most populous US cities in the country. Uh, at our peak, we had uh, 220 miles of streetcar track. Our urban population peaked in the 1950s and steadily declined after the dawn of the automobile and the construction of the interstate highway system. The 2020 census was the first time Cincinnati has seen population growth in 60 years. And it's because more people want to live in places that are walkable, bikeable, and accessible. Fortunately, the leaders of our city had the forethought to preserve our precious green space and hillsides. Today, Cincinnati parks are ranked number four in the country, and 88% of residents live within a 10-mile walk of a park, which is why we're working to connect our world-class park system with a network of linear parks the Crown Urban Trail Loop. Crown stands for the Cincinnati Riding or Walking Network. It's a vision to connect the Wassam Way Trail, the Little Miami Scenic Trail, the Ohio River Trail, and the Mill Creek Greenway to form a network that people can use for recreation and transportation. Uh -oh. There we go, okay. Uh, Crown builds on the past success of the Little Miami Scenic Trail, also known as the Loveland Bike Trail which was one of the first rail trails in the country. It's now part of the 326 mile Ohio to Erie Trail, which travels all the way to Cleveland, Ohio. The way we were able to do it is by creating a robust public-private partnership. Three nonprofits came together, the Wassam Way, Ohio River Way, and Tri-State Trails, to uh, leverage state and federal grant funding that public parties have applied for, like the city of Cincinnati, Great Parks of Hamilton County, and others. Our, private, our private fundraising effort, led by Women Jam Portman, set out to raise $8 million to connect 24 miles in the planned 34-mile trail loop. This includes completing the Wassam Way Trail, which is number one there on the map, and connecting it to Uptown, number two, and to the Little Miami Scenic Trail, number three, and completing the Ohio River Trail from downtown to Lincoln Airport. Altogether, this project is estimated to cost close to $60 million. So far, we've raised over $42 million in partnership with the City of Cincinnati and Great Parks of Hamilton County. And thanks to the incredible generosity of our community, we've raised $10 million in private funding toward our cause from 2019 to 2021. We were able to do this thanks to three cornerstone Cincinnati businesses and one foundation, the jewels in the crown. Kroger Health, United Dairy Farmers, Procter & Gamble, and the Margin Charles J. Schott Foundation each contributed $1 million to support the Crown Capital Campaign. And uh, back in October, we were proud to donate the first $1.1 million to the city of Cincinnati as the match for the uh, phases, phases of the Wassam Way Trail that were recently built. Collectively, what our public-private partnership has been able to accomplish has been transformational. The city is turning what was a derelict railroad corridor into a vibrant trail for people-powered movement. 
From 2018 to 2021, the city of Cincinnati constructed the Wasson Way Trail from Montgomery Road to Xavier University through Alt Park to connect to the Murray Path, which goes into downtown Marymount. For the first time since the 1950s, uh, Evanston and Avondale are being reconnected to Norwood, Hyde Park, and Mount Lookout with a safe path for active transportation. While the initial investment is in asphalt, the trail is creating a sense of place that is for the community, inspired, uh, inspiring public art, landscaping improvements, and connectivity. The trail is also spurring economic development, like the Buskins Bakery in the background there, which uh, turns their frontage around and now has a walk-up window uh, to the trail. In 2021, the city cut the ribbon on a scenic segment of the trail through the treetops of Alt Park. What once was an iconic rail trestle uh, that you could walk uh, to on the Valley Trail is now an iconic multi-use path. With a scenic switchback navigating down to the valley of the Duck Creek tributary to the Little Miami River, over the next several years, great parks of Hamilton County, Columbia Township, and the village of Marymount will complete the trail connection down to the Little Miami Scenic Trail. The trail will run, through, uh, run along a former trolley route through Marymount and connect down to 50 West Brewery. Great Parks recently completed a long-awaited connection from the end of the Little Miami Scenic Trail at Beachmont Avenue to the Lunkin Airport and Auto Arm Leader Park trails. This engineering feat included a tunnel, a retaining wall, and a bridge over a state and national scenic river to overcome a critically unsafe gap at the Beachmont Levee. One of the final pieces we're working to get the final approval for is the Ohio River Trail from Lincoln Airport to downtown following the former Oasis Rail Line. In partnership with SORTA or Metro, uh, Great Parks is going to repurpose an unused rail line and turn it into the final section of the Ohio to Erie Trail. In 2020, this site was the uh, location of uh, Walworth Junc Junction, uh, which is the first time that Homerama came to the city of Cincinnati. And one of the most impactful segments is coming next, the Wasson Way connection to Uptown. The city of Cincinnati and Sorda are partnering to repurpose another rail line uh, from Xavier University to Uptown. We're making connections to majority black neighborhoods like Evanston and Avondale, neighborhoods that also have high rates of zero car households. Construction is planned to start later this year. It's going to reactivate a former railroad bridge over Victory Parkway and connect into Avondale where it will finally tie into the Uptown Innovation Corridor at Martin Luther King Drive and Reading Road, which is uh, right where my office is over at the Digital Futures Building. Um, I believe that this connection is going to fundamentally change the landscape for biking in Cincinnati because then so many people who live along the Wasson Way and Little Miami Scenic Trail will have a safe passage to get to the region's second largest employment hub. A future connection is in design now for the route that will connect from the Uptown Innovation Corridor to main campus. From there, uh, we hope that a spider web of trails and protected bike lanes will catalyze to connect all the assets around Uptown with safe bicycling infrastructure. And you know, as UC has embraced this new uh, motto of next lives here and innovation, you know, we really have to think about how innovation is reflected in our transportation options to get to campus, which right now is predominantly automobile. Where the rail rights of way no longer exist, the city is looking to calm traffic by reconfiguring wide thoroughfares like Gilbert Avenue from four lanes to three and adding protected bike lanes with pedestrian safety and transit improvements. This effort will, purpose, uh, will repurpose space in our largest public asset by acreage, our roadway network, into comfortable space for people to walk, bike, and be active in their communities. One example is right outside this building at Clifton Avenue, uh, where we have installed an interim protected bike lane. This is a perfect example of how we can make affordable improvements today while we work towards making the longer term more permanent investments like Wasson Way. We installed this mile long, mile long project in partnership with the city of Cincinnati and the DeVue Good Foundation for under $100,000, and it reduced speeding by 40%. Now we're in the planning stages to complete the loop uh, and finish the Mill Creek Greenway Trail and connect it to the Ohio River Trail West and to Smale River Front Park. 
This route will build on past and future investments like the Lick Run Greenway and the new Western Hills Viaduct, both of which have a, uh, which have a trail component in them. Fulfilling a present need to connect Cincinnati's west side to downtown with safe biking routes. While also celebrating the resurgence of the Mill Creek and reconnecting residents to the urban stream, which has experienced a tremendous environmental comeback. Now is the time to make this investment for future generations of Cincinnatians. With an unprecedented amount of federal funding available today, if not now, then when? Together, we can build the crown for the Queen City. Thank you. Wade, thank you very much. And as a uh, cyclist who still has my bicycle from high school, I want to know when you're going to add the sweet jumps and grind rails, because it's a one speed. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I could make that whole loop without dying, but I will try. I once did the little Miami bike trail on a one-speed bike, uh, 20 miles there and back. That was uh, crazy. Speaking of little Miami, though, we've gone from Singapore to Cincinnati. I think we're going to California. I'm pretty sure I know how to say this guy's name because I think we went to high school together. Um, next up, Joe Stitzline, BSDE95, and Leslie Stitzline, BSDE92, Brand and Typeface Systems. Uh, Joe is a San Francisco Bay Area graphic designer and creative director. He's worked with startups, Fortune 500 brands, governments, technology leaders, and Olympic athletes to create brand identity systems, iconic marketing communications, consumer experiences, and brand-defining products. Defining products. Brand-defining. That would be a whole different animal. Um, he has a wealth of experience working with a diverse range of clients, including Airbnb, Apple, Google, Meta, Netflix, and Nike. He's led the design of various experiences and products, including the Google Store and Michelle Obama's Let's Move program for healthy schools. In 2016, Joe co-founded Stitzline Studio, a brand identity, typeface design, and digital experience practice based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Joe has designed typefaces and logo types for Facebook, Apple, Nike, Netflix, Lily, Dwell Magazine, Rangers FC, Sempra Energy, and SGI. Uh, he's designed or directed custom fonts in every major writing system in the world, including Latin, Pan-African, Cyrillic, Greek, Hebrew, Hindi, Japanese, Korean, simplified and traditional Chinese, Thai, and Vietnamese. I didn't hear Arabesh or uh, Mandalorian, so no Star Wars stuff, apparently, but whatever, <laughs> fine. It's cool, cool, weird flex, Joe. But anyway, no, sorry. <laughs> Leslie began her career in 1992 in San Francisco. Emerging high-tech and biotech companies in Silicon Valley were her first clients. Over three decades, Leslie has developed broad knowledge and expertise in how to use design and storytelling to communicate groundbreaking technologies. Her work has included cryptocurrency banks, fusion energy generators, and hydrogen aviation. She has had the opportunity to work with a variety of high-profile clients in the tech and biotech industries, including Airbnb, Cloudaria, Anchorage Digital, and Intuitive Surgical. Brand identity systems for cultural organizations such as Head Start, KQED, and the SFMOMA have been an important part of her work. Leslie co-founded Stitzline Studio in 2016. Stitzline Studio, again, is a brand identity, typeface design, and digital experience practice based in San Francisco Bay Area. Before that, she worked at esteemed design consultancies such as Pentagram and Landor Associates. Joe and Leslie, you have the stage. Uh, well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, we're all very excited to be here. Um, and thank you for uh, to Tim and Wade uh, for your great presentations. It's so great to see the creativity of fellow DAP alumni. Um, hi, everyone out there. Great to, to meet you. Um, we're excited to be with you today to walk you through our work in creating graphic design systems and typeface systems that are um, crafted and, and emotional. Um, we call that systems that make you feel something. Uh, just a brief introduction of us. It's hard to, uh, I think we've covered that pretty well. Um, <laughs> my name is Joe Stitzline. I graduated in 1995 back when DAP handed out graphic design degrees, I believe you call that uh, visual communication now. Leslie, you want to introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Leslie Stitzline, and uh, as a 1992 graphic design 
DAF graduate. I'm really excited to be here today to talk with you about our studio and our approach to brand systems and custom typography. We have a global team that has developed identities and typeface systems for well-known brands like Airbnb, Google, Meta, and Nike. We've been lucky to work with many iconic brands and have taken these lessons into our own studio. The foundation of our practice is in brand design, systems and identities. We often work with technology brands to help launch groundbreaking inventions. We enjoy working closely with them to translate these often complicated innovations into simple and inspiring design systems. And our, our mission is to use storytelling technology and craft to create iconic design systems that make people feel something. So we're gonna break down what that means and show you a couple of case studies. Um, first of all, every design system uh, is really based on a story. Um, every aesthetic choice we make is purposeful and is based on a creative or strategic hook that we then translate into an ownable visual system. Um, at Stitzline Studio, we are uh, enthusiastic about technology and we constantly hunt for new ways and platforms to bring life and delight to our work. Um, and then uh, lastly, at the core of our work, of course, is the timeless obsession with craft. Uh, which we learned a lot about at DAP. This gives the work integrity, but it also serves as an ambassador for the quality of our clients' products. All of these aspects come together into our approach for iconic design systems that you can feel. Uh, Leslie, do you want to walk through um, our first case study? Sure. Uh, we've recently been working with clients in sustainable energy, Last year, we were approached by a German brand developing a hydrogen fuel cell to decarbonize air travel. Do you want to go to the next slide? We learned an interesting insight that uh, hydrogen fuel works well for flights up to 1,000 kilometers, and this is almost half of air travel worldwide. Hydrogen fuel cells are complex, but we quickly found that the aspect that mattered to humanity the most was that the output of hydrogen fuel cells is pure water. So we use this insight to build the story for the H2Fly design system. We developed a pattern and a graphic language to capture the idea of this flight path of water. And this was the beginning of the design system. Water is a powerful but unexpected visual in an air travel brand. Everything in the H2Fly system is designed to look like it's fluid and in motion. This is a before and after on the left is the uh, previous logo on the right is our update. Um, we wanted the logo to evoke a sense of futuristic technology and speed. We designed a color palette with aqua to feel energetic, fresh and sustainable. And everything in the system is fluid and in motion, even in static posters. We also use animation to bring typography to life. And the feeling of movement can be applied to apparel to bring energy to these as well. The overall system is futuristic, bold, and confident, uh, fairly unexpected for a sustainable brand. And the lesson we learned is that sustainability can come to life as an exciting, futuristic, and optimistic design system. Now, along with brand design systems, we're known for our work on typography, whether that's the word marks or custom typeface system or fonts. Um, and that really stems from our work in creating uh, logo types uh, and word marks for well-known brands from Dwell to Netflix and Lily um, and beyond. Um, that's 
really taught us that the core of a brand system can be typography. And uh, sometimes we extend that into full font systems as well, and two of which we'll walk you through today. Um, one project we did for a cryptocurrency wallet was to create a global uh, font that could be the anchor of their entire brand system. Um, now the, this was a really interesting project in that the objective was to create one font that included every major language in the world so they could reach almost all 8 billion people with this crypto wallet. The challenge was how to apply local design insights to a global font system so that the font doesn't feel too generic and too American when designing localized alphabets, uh, which is an interesting challenge you face because people put a lot of emphasis uh, when they choose a font. And I think because of the use of things like Google Slides and Google Docs, um, everyone is very familiar with the power of fonts now and is very choiceful about fonts all around the world. And so they have a really critical eye when they see fonts. And so it's a really interesting challenge to start with a, a Latin font and then adapt that to other cultures around the world. Now this font came in many, many variants from Cyrillic to Greek to Nigerian, Hebrew and Thai. And we're gonna walk you through uh, the Thai variant today. Um, now, typically we start with the Latin, um, that uh, usually establishes the aesthetic system and the DNA of the font. Uh, but some of the design choices we make as Americans that are um, applied to a Latin font have to be changed and adapted when we localize those fonts for other cultures. So for example, when we created the Thai version of the cryptocurrency wallet font, um, we had to be really um, aware of the specifics of Thai culture and Thai aesthetics and adapt those into the font. Uh, the Thai alphabet is not as clean as the Latin or Roman font that we're all familiar with. It is inherently more detailed, more expressive. It has more curves than the Roman alphabet. Uh, and we had to um, adapt that into our font system. Um, and that also comes to life in other uh, cultural um, expressions such as their architecture as well. Now, Thai is also structured completely differently than Roman in the way that consonants and vowels come together. Uh, it's a consonant-based system with accents and vowels that travel around the consonants on all sides to modify how they're pronounced. So to ensure that we did this appropriately, we worked with three Thai type speakers, uh, with three Thai speakers to make sure our forms were culturally correct and that the unique vowel accent structure was incorporated. This was not just a design effort, it was also an engineering effort um, to accomplish this. We worked with an engineering team because Thai fonts have quite a bit of code that's custom to them as well. And so that's where we really enjoy understanding a lot about the cultures we're trying to communicate against, but also how do we leverage technologies to accomplish that in a way that comes to life naturally. Comparing the, the Thai to the Latin, um, there are subtle but important differences, even with similar forms. So there are forms that appear to be similar to our U and our A, but they're totally different uh, forms, of course, and they have different proportions and even a different height um, than similar forms. And we so we can't just scale up the Roman forms and, and adapt them. They have to be completely modified and redrawn. And so the challenge is how do you have a holistic system to a global font, but then make the right choices working with Thai consultants so it appears authentic to their culture. And here's the side-by-side -side comparison between Thai, uh, the, the Latin, of course, within the font, and then the Hebrew. Um, each of them uh, comes to life in ways that reflect their local cultures. And the result is modern, um, expressive, and culturally appropriate as well. And that's where it's really fascinating for us to work with designers all around the world to learn about different cultures, to have conversations around each curve and the impact that has and how one, one choice might be authentic and another one might be too American. And then we really are good at listening and adapting and consulting with uh, a variety of experts all around the world so that we make choices that feel authentic. And then here it is set in longer copy as well. So the lesson learned is that local audiences can really tell when a font looks generically American. And I think that 
uh, lesson can be applied to not only font systems, but it can also apply to graphic design systems as well, and I'm sure other design disciplines. So when we work around the world, whether it's in Germany or in Thailand or any other country, it's important for us to work with people that understand the cultures so that we don't um, come in with choices that feel generically American. Uh, and to do that, we work with local design experts on every nuance and detail of the system. Uh, the second font we want to talk about, share today is uh, a retail release that we just completed called Hamster. Now, this is really a technology led uh, font, um, and we've been leveraging a couple of different technologies that have emerged in fonts in the last few years so we can create a font that has joy and surprise and delight. It feels alive. We use the new color font format along with variable font format. Those are two different formats that have emerged in the last few years to create a colorful and joyful aesthetic to the font. Um, the reason it's named Hamster is because it's got a distinctive color layering um, of two layers uh, that can come in pre-selected color palettes. Um, of course, we all work with fonts day to day in our lives, um, and we have to apply color to them. With color fonts, they come with color baked in. And so uh, we worked um, with, Leslie actually chose nine different palettes to apply to the font that we could come with. And so those would be baked into the font when you receive it. And so we really thought of them as a collection of seasonal colorways. I don't know if there are any fashion designers on the uh, call today, but you're, you know, at Nike, we thought a lot about seasonal drops and seasonal colorways with shoe collections. Uh, of course, with apparel collections, we took the same approach with Hamster to choose nine uh, really beautiful but different palettes that the font could come in and treat it almost more like a seasonal collection. Now, the color font format gives us some interesting and unique design opportunities compared to traditional fonts. Each letter form is designed to optimize the color layering that is distinctive and comes from color fonts. So, for example, the X or the 8, uh, the X twists and turns, um, and that's because of the way the colors interact. Um, and that's only possible because it's a color font, um, a traditional a one color uh, font, if you will, wouldn't have that layering opportunity. Uh, the yin yang of the layering of the eight is only possible because of that color layering that comes from the color font format. So this is a really great example of how we uh, use technology to create new design aesthetics and expressions that are born out of those technology opportunities. And the result really is a, del is a delightful font that uses technology to create fun and joy. And also it comes with patterns that are designed to interlock very, very specifically. Uh, they could create wallpapers, but again, they're very precise and very geometric, but at the end of the day, we want people to use these tools and, and, and create a sense of joy and delight. It also includes some built-in built hamster emojis that we worked with one of our illustrator friends on. So uh, another fun opportunity in, in the color font format. And the lesson learned here, as I mentioned, is that technology can create design systems that are not only precise and rational, but also are emotional, make you feel, um, uh, make you feel delighted, and also have a sense of being alive as well. So today we shared how designers can use storytelling, technology, and craft to create iconic design systems that make people feel something. And we hope these lessons were helpful and inspiring. Um, and we'd love to hear from all of you and stay in touch. So feel free to drop us a line and say hello at Stithline Studio. Thank you, Joe and Leslie, very much. Uh, this was a double win for me because, yes, that is the Joe I haven't seen in 33 years. So hi. Um, and also, <laughs> that answered the question I've always had. I, I spent eight years in New Jersey. There, was a, there were a lot of Korean businesses, and I always was fascinated by the typeface. And I'm like, how do mm -hmm. serif fonts translate? And... I, I wondered about it, and now I know a guy, so, or and a, I, I know a group. <laughs> I yes. know a studio. Yeah, <laughs> it's a fun part of our, our our work is working and learning about cultures, and um, every every culture has a writing system, and it's really amazing to be able to talk with experts about those. Very great.
Thank you, Joe and Leslie. Nice to see you, Joe. I saw Steve Reynolds at a Royal Crescent Mob reunion just last year. So there oh, you go. Nice. There you go. Nice. nice to see you. <laughs> that nobody here knows what we're Thank talking you. about. So, Thank you both. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Joe Bye-bye. and Leslie. Um, up next is Sin- Sydney Moeller, BSID 2011. I hope it's Moeller. You'll have to correct me if I'm wrong. Sorry, Sydney. Brand story and the immersive workplace experience. Former Disney Imagineer and workplace enthusiast, Sidney Moeller has spent the last decade exploring the world of workplace design. Firmly believing that life is too short to work in a dreary workspace, amen, Sidney has embarked on a journey to transform the office into a dynamic, engaging destination for all. As associate principal and workplace strategies practice leader, she is committed to developing spaces that celebrate industry brands and enhance organizational culture, improving the workplace experience for years to come. Sydney, you have the stage. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for having me, DAPX. It is a pleasure to be here today. Since our focus is on uh, experiential design, I wanted to talk a little bit about the workplace experience. Let's start with something fun and interactive. Through a quick show of hands, how many of you here have worked at a job that you did not like? Don't be shy, we won't tell anyone. (laughs) So about 75% of this room has worked at a job that they did not love. For those of you who didn't raise your hands, the descriptor of relationship status, descriptor of it's complicated, probably applies somewhere along the way. There's a lot to unpack with that question. There's so many factors that impact the workplace experience from the office environment itself, um, to the type of work you were doing, to the people you were working with. I'm sure everyone here has worked with at least one coworker who made your work experience memorable. For what it's worth, you're not alone. Um, I've also had the opportunity to work at a place that I did not like. And it looked a little something like this. It was a place where it was pretty evident to me that me and my immediate coworkers were not valued. The workplace was depressing and a complete afterthought. We parked on a poorly lit street, And to top it all off, the company wouldn't even give us business cards because in their minds, there was no expectation that I or my coworkers would ever be in a position to represent the company or somehow influence the business in any way. It was while I was working here in the early days of my career that I did some math and a little research to figure out how much of my life I could be spending in this workplace purgatory. I discovered some research by Andrew Neighbor, an industrial and organizational psychologist with a nonprofit research company called Randcorp. He conducted a study a little over five years ago that found that the average person spends about 90,000 hours of their life working. That translates to a third of a lifetime spent at work. As I let that rather heavy finding sink in on my drive home, I decided I needed to reframe my perspective. Life is too short to spend decades punching a time clock. We need to make the workplace somewhere we all wanna be. So with this fresh perspective, I continued my research and I found a new job. Gallup has been tracking employee engagement uh, over the last 20 plus years, and the good news is that overall employee engagement is going up over the last decade. The less good news is that we're still only hovering somewhere around about 32% of employees who say they're engaged at work. Additionally, there are hundreds of articles acknowledging that savvy business owners recognize that their team members are their most valuable asset. To put some numbers to it, workplace strategist Heather McGowan conducted a study of S&P 500 companies that found that 85% of an enterprise's value comes from human capital. In more humanistic terms, that means that the skills and talents of individual team members bringing them to the company account for 85% of a company's value. To add a final finding, the Society of Human Resource Management found that the overall costs associated with attrition when people leave their company can be as high as 90 to 200% of that person's salary. Team members are expensive to lose. So if we agree that the value that individual contributors are bringing to a company are what is driving the majority of a company's value, but overall the team's engagement remains well uh, well below 50%, what does that say about the workplace experience as a whole? It means that we have some work to do when it comes to helping the team feel valued at work. With the rise of the experience economy, individual interactivity with a product, brand, or space matter more than ever. It can make the difference between overnight success and the sting of failure. This is especially true for the workplace experience in this post-pandemic world. How do we get people excited to come back to the office, to feel and be productive while they're there, and to enhance engagement to lower the significant costs of attrition? Through the last decade of working with clients asking questions like this, we found that there are three key elements that drive a successful workplace experience. Place, purpose, and belonging. 
Place is that feeling you have when you're transported to a different world. It immerses you in a brand or a storytelling experience. It lays the foundation for a journey and offers a great sense of possibility and fuels excitement. Purpose is that compelling sense of contributing to a higher cause. Have you ever been fully engaged in a project or a hobby where you lost all sense of time because what you were working on was so meaningful and engaging? That's a purpose-driven experience. Belonging is that feeling of being invited, welcomed, and appreciated. I think we've all had that experience of being new to a school, a team, or a, you know, a company. And belonging is about forging connections, and equally important, the environment in which those connections happen. Every workplace in the world handles place, purpose, and belonging a little differently. It's unique to that company's brand and culture. And even when a company isn't actively managing these elements within their organization, they are still there, and they can potentially wreck, the, wreck havoc on the best laid corporate goals. So what does place, purpose, and belonging look like within the workplace experience? During the pandemic, we partnered with EA, Electronic Arts, on their New Orlando campus to address these topics and help them create a unified space that was both an ode to their culture and also an environment as immersive as their games. EA is on a mission to inspire the world to play. Their brand includes high profile games such as the Madden NFL series in FIFA to Star Wars and the Sims gaming media. With a global presence, there's a wider corporate brand and culture that is present, but each of their office locations has their own identity. One of the challenges we navigated with this project was condensing their team, which was previously spread out over multiple buildings in a suburban campus, into a brand new single downtown anchor building in a highly creative area. The Orlando team has these incredibly unique artifacts, from framed tickets from every Super Bowl game, to football helmets from every college football champion, to a gaming controller in their garden. They even have a ball pit conference table. These icons are hallmarks of the EA brand, but they also carry a special meaning for the local team as the individual contributors who add the creativity and create the gaming collateral that accompanies these items. As an organization, EA has a rich history and has clearly invested a lot of time into their workplace culture. It was important to us to start from the beginning to understand how EA Orlando fit within the wider EA brand, and also as well as understanding where they wanted to go. As it relates to place, purpose, and belonging, this team wanted a workplace that had a wow factor to rival other EA locations. This group is competing for talent among the Silicon Valley behemoths, so the expectations of a cool workplace are really important. Living in Florida, the team has the luxury of spending a little more time outdoors most of the year, so maximizing opportunities with the local climate was equally a priority. As a wider organization, EA has made a significant cultural investment in their diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, and it was important to the local team that these goals were reflected in the built environment. One small final factor to keep in mind here, this project kicked off in January of 2020. So while we were navigating place, purpose, and belonging as it relates to the EA Orlando design, we were also taking into account the frequently changing health data as it pertained to the pandemic and designing a five-story office environment for a team that was fully remote. Fortunately, the EA team took a longer term view of their office and we embarked together on a design that both planned for flexible collaboration and experiences that might look very different in a post-COVID world. When it came to place, we worked to balance the corporate aesthetic with a distinctly local feel. Our concept focused heavily on the blending of the digital and natural worlds that EA crafts so well in their gaming experiences. We developed a lobby that was instantly immersive, guiding the eye into the space and magnetically drawing the team and guests alike into the EA workspace. The lobby features an eye-catching display visible to the street that highlights the latest gaming developments, as well as incorporating wooden ceiling elements become more refined and polished as you moved into the space. The immersive sense of place continues throughout the rest of the building, focusing on specific gathering zones, such as the cafe, which opens to an inviting outdoor uh, patio, the staircase that offers visibility and fosters connectivity throughout the building, and the beer and cheer space located on the fifth floor balcony, or adjacent to the fifth floor balcony, that overlooks the up and coming downtown Orlando Creative Village. To lay the groundwork for purpose within the space, we took advantage of the wide inventory of unique EA branded artifacts that we spoke about earlier and created dedicated homes for them within the office environment. Like many diverse teams who require a variety of work styles to be accommodated from focus tasks to training seminars to everything in between, we designed a variety of working zones to foster team member choice in how they work best. Pairing the memorable artifacts within a multitude of spaces and maximizing visibility throughout the building yields a space that both supports purpose-driven work and continues engagement through storytelling design elements infused within the space. 
Now, when we talked about belonging a short while ago, we talked about how it's about forging connections to create a sense of welcome between individuals. Despite our best efforts to intentionally make connections happen at times, some of the most meaningful moments that create a sense of belonging occur organically. Within EA space, we focused our attention on creating collision opportunities, places that could foster these organic interactions and fuel that sense of belonging. We leveraged uh, shared spaces, artwork, and nature to underscore the opportunities to connect with, with the local team and the wider EA brand. When looking to cultivate a positive workplace experience, a sense of belonging may be the most important investment leaders can make. These key experiences of place, purpose, and belonging aren't new, and they can do so much to elevate the experience of brand and organization. Whether we're looking to enhance a team's engagement, promote productivity, or simply increase retention, when leaders thoughtfully invest in their workspace, their team feels valued. Being valued helps the team feel a sense of pride about their space. It builds enthusiasm and loyalty for an organization, and it helps people feel more fulfilled. After all, if we're gonna spend one third of our lifetime working, shouldn't it be somewhere we're excited to be every day? Thank you. I have neither walked nor shaken hands in a while, so I'm bad at both right now. <laughs> Thanks, COVID. It, Sydney, thank you for that. You're, you're speaking my language because I have been a workplace strategist for a while now. And so I was like, yeah, that's everything. So I was happily agreeing with most of that. Um, well, actually, all of it, I should say. Uh, thank you again. Now, the next person I've got my eye on because I think she's going to take my job next year. And if she does, she's going to do a great job. And she probably won't fall. And she knows how to shake hands. Um, Adoria Maxberry, MA uh, class of 20, time to inspire, create, and glow. Grow, glow, grow. She said don't say Gloria, now I've got it on my brain. Uh, <laughs> Adoria L. Maxbury is a visual artist, educator, wife, and mother of three in Cincinnati, Ohio. She facilitates unique, meaningful art experiences with a focus on creativity, exploration, and reflection. Her company, Most Outgrowing LLC, is dedicated to helping others grow spiritually, mentally, and creatively through art. Adoria earned a Master of Visual Arts Education and Licensure from the University of Cincinnati DAP and a Bachelor's of Arts from Xavier University. She's your, her own walk and talk and cross town shootout. That's pretty cool. Uh, she was acknowledged as the DAP 2020 School of Art Outstanding Graduate Student. Adoria serves as Visual Arts Educator at Woodford Academy, a lead teaching artist for arts work, and voice actress and lead puppeteer on the Emmy winning Books Alive for Kids series, Pages Place. Recently recognized as a 2022 Black is Excellence Unsung Hometown Hero by the City of Cincinnati and NAEA Crayola Ambassador, Adoria ultimately seeks to bring God glory and encourage others in all that she does. Adoria, please come take over. <laughs> I mean, so guys, I'll be honest with you. I asked them, which Adoria do you want? You know, being a little bit of an actress, I feel like, yeah, I could do you know, the academia Adoria because I did a little bit of ethnographic research here and I am very prepared to give you that Adoria, but also I'm coming fresh from Woodford Academy and you're gonna get elementary school teacher Adoria <laughs> or just plain old me. So is that okay with everybody? Good, that's what you were gonna get anyway. So I'm gonna tell you a little story today about the craziness that is my life. So bear with me, all right? I see that we're connecting and reflecting. So I felt like it was fitting to reflect. You see, I've been doing this whole speaking thing for a while. I didn't realize it, but there's a seed within each and every one of you that has been there since you were born. You see, this garden that we're in, this thing called life, I tend to believe that each and every one of us can flourish and grow in unique ways and every single one of us has a gift inside of us. My goal is to help people do that and understand what that gift is through art. You see, I didn't always realize what my gifts were, but I found that I've continued to be able to flourish in them, whether I realize it or not. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that crazy path that I've been on and hopefully stay within my time frame. You see, I've always been an artist, but I didn't always trust in my gifts as an artist. You see, I wanted to go to DAP, but I didn't think that I was good enough. 
Yeah, I did studio RDP, all that jazz. Followed the art path at Walnut Hills and realized, ah, I don't know that I would make it. Fast forward, I'm a graduate student. <laughs> you heard, you heard, I did it guys, I did it. <laughs> there are a few spoiler alerts in the bio, so you know, just act like it's a surprise once I get to it, okay? Cool. But that thing that was always within me that I just innately did continued to grow and develop to where you'll see on one side, first grade Adoria, student at Woodford Academy, who was named after the first principal there, who happens to teach there, because her mom taught there for over 34 years, happened to be placed in a garden of possibilities. You see, in commemorating the life of my mom, who wound up passing shortly after I graduated, and remembering my father, who passed while I was a graduate student, carrying my third child, who ha, wound up realizing that I was blessed to have inside of me my entire graduate career, because, you know, somehow there are challenges or soil that you're placed in, right? That adversity creates an environment for you to grow. And you see, I'd like to believe that some of that is due to that guy. He's sitting in the back, he's kind of cute. Mr. Maxberry, you see that same garden that we were placed in at Woodford Academy is where we met, first grade, students. Look to your right, look to your left is what I tell my students and they sometimes realize, wait, I could be married to my, ew. I said, I know, I know, we play tag, that guy. So on the right hand side, my right, your left, you'll notice Mr. Maxberry and myself and then you'll see us looking into the future. So let's jump into this future because we were fortunate enough to birth this little lady. You see, a six year old birthday party transform my life. I was asked, mommy, we always create together. Can I have a paint themed birthday party because mommy always threw, you know, elaborately themed parties. It was really my excuse to get all the things that I've ever wanted, cotton candy machines and, you know, throw a rodeo themed party because uh, mommy's from Texas. So why not do all the crazy things and use the kid as the excuse to get away with it? <laughs> Smart, right? Well, this paint theme birthday party turned into a catalyst that would jumpstart my career, or at least what I, I didn't think to be a career, right? Because every parent said, you need to do this in real life. I'm like, oh, I've got a great job. I'm at Fifth Third Bank, I'm in corporate America. I'm climbing the ladder, it'll be a Doria Third Bank one day. I am ambitious, right? <laughs> Graduate student, communication arts, public relations grad, Doria Maxberry was gonna take over the world, just in a different way. You see, that turned into me realizing that, yes, my corporate America career was giving me joy as I was helping others grow and develop, but as I moved into an individual contributor role and an officer of the bank in vendor management, I was gaining the business acumen and the skills that I needed to ensure that most outgrowing would flourish. But I was most happy when I was doing Young Bankers Club or teaching within Adopt the Class or that volunteerism work that made my heart leap where I was able to help students grow and develop. And that's when I realized, as my mom so eloquently noted, you realize when you do those art parties, you're actually teaching. I'm like, ugh, <laughs> this was a setup. <laughs> She's right. No, I'm instructing. And you see, realizing that I wanted to be better for my customers, I decided, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna enhance my skills. But before doing that, I continued to work the gift. And I'll show you a little bit of evidence of that. But fast forward from the time where that job turned into you know, this, this career that's pulling me out of what I thought was normalcy, this art party thing flourished, and that's when Most Outgrowing was birthed. You see, I took a play on my superlative in high school, Most Outgoing, where I love to talk to everybody and connect with others and understand what's that thing that makes your, your heart happy. That turned into a play on that superlative where I believe that not everybody could be best athlete, best this, best that, but everybody could grow. And not only could they grow, they could exceed expectations and grow beyond whatever the norm was. My goal is to help people do that through art. Well, realizing that I probably needed some credentials behind me, fast forward, by the way, uh, you'll notice that same mural that I stood on the bridge watching mural create and I said, wow, one day I'm going to be painting those. One day I desire to do that only to realize that I'm standing next to the artist himself and we snapped a picture. I'm like, this is amazing. And I'd look into 21C. I'd look at the CAC and go, this is, this is what I, I dream of one day. 
You see, that art was festering, and more and more events would happen. And Miami University, one day, where Brian is helping me and during a workshop along with several team members, he goes, wait a second, we got paid for each of the people in here, you know, all of these? What's holding you back? Ugh. This one, the one who's analytical thinker, is the one asking me what's holding me back? Okay, all right, and then I, I have to believe it's God. It's all, I don't mean to preach to you, but I will. There was a copious amount of little people that would come up to me and say different things that were going to ensure that I was going to go down this trail. You see, one child during a banking tour, giving them the tour of the operations center says, you know, you're capable of so much more. And this is after I give them a skit <laughs> and, you know, show them what not to do in an interview. And I show up like, it was good, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, that was really good. And then I come back to my students. Welcome, hi, nice to meet you, I'm a tour nice. So the kids were like, you know, you're meant for more. I'm like, what? That kid apparently knew that I was going to be Emmy nominated. That kid apparently knew that I did have way more in me, and I don't know who sent these children or who birthed them, but thank God, because as soon as I said goodbye to the bank, I wound up being blessed with this commission. My very first mural, which is overlooking the community garden in Walnut Hills High School, or Walnut Hills, the neighborhood, excuse me, can you tell I'm an eagle? Maybe I will, I will say Walnut Hills at any given time. Class of 05, thank you. And across from that is the very first school that I was asked to be a guest artist at. Remember that fact, okay? It's gonna come into play. So it overlooks Frederick Douglass, it's behind Life Skills, and Life Skills who commissioned Most Outgrowing for their first piece, right? That turns into other schools requesting murals, including my alma mater, where I didn't work there at the time, but that was actually my interview day to become the art teacher there. Why? Because I decided I wanna be better for not only my customers, but for everyone that interacts with Most Outgrowing. I'm gonna go back, and you know what? I'm gonna have a conversation with that. Why? Because I got assigned a mentor as a YWCA rising star, and, and, and that mentee happened to go to DAP. And as I'm reading through the programming, I'm like, you know what? That is right up my alley. This Master's of Visual Arts Education, it's speaking to me. You know what? Let's try it. Let's try it. So I had a whole conversation with Chris Holland who says, you know what? You would be perfect for this. Long story short, guess what? Did the program. Huh. You know that I graduated. And turns out I got my Master's of Visual Arts Education. So while I'm, I'm being this guest artist. I'm long-term subbing. I'm here at the school uh, right across the street from my first mural. And they go, will you, will you sub here? Will you sub here? I'm like, I really like this teaching thing. It's crazy. So now I'm running the business simultaneously and creating these murals that I now get to walk by every day, including this one in the cafeteria at the school that I teach at. Because guess what? Spoiler alert, I got the job. You heard it in the bio. <laughs> yeah. But... What's really neat is that opportunity turned into so many more, including the Black Lives Matter mural, where I am blessed to say I'm the letter M. You see, a conversation, a seed that was planted where I said, you know what, if something can be done, I'd like to do it. And that's where my husband goes, you know, if they create a Black Lives Matter mural here in Cincinnati, you need to be the one to do it. <laughs> okay, cool story. He didn't know that I had written that down, and it's like, yes, I want it create change through my artwork. I wanna be able to use my voice in, a, in a, a unique way. And turns out that I was asked, hey, would you be interested in this? By a colleague at the bank who knew that I was a bit of an artist. So in the mural it says, they buried us but forgot we're seeds. I'm remembering that you guys are all seeds. Same things that are within me are the ones that are within you, right? These crazy ideas, these dreams, these visions. Okay, I'll get back to it. Anywho, fast forward. There's all these exhibits and fun things happening from private lessons to being a part of Mortar to being the board member of Revolution Dance Theater and all the other random organizations and things that continue to help me to grow and develop into who I am now, leading into more collaborations that were birthed from the Black Lives Matter mural, including making the shirts for Michael Copage, which all started out as just me wanting to make sure I had aprons for my business and apparel for my, my team members to wear. That led into designing an entire streetcar. Guys, if you ever see me running downtown going, oh my God, that's, my God, that's my name. It's because I still cannot believe that a design on my iPad is on a bus, a sketch 
a doodle, right? So I venture to say if I can meet with artists like Cedric Cox where I was able to design, or where he designed this mural that I'm able to execute on behalf of Artworks and become a lead teaching artist, all from someone who didn't believe they were good enough, and if the green button works, we're gonna proceed, there we go, to a designer for Artworks, having three murals designed by yours truly, overlooking Evanston, commemorating an environment, a, a neighborhood that has fostered my education, commemorating those that, I mean, I love, including my brother who's playing the guitar there, and recognizing King's records, all the way to creating pieces for my alma mater, Xavier University, and commemorating the lives lost as a result of senseless violence, then I'd venture to say you can do it too. Because you know, doing a PD on behalf of my company in the same classroom that is now my classroom where I was replacing my old art teacher who retired is this surreal feeling that I get to walk into every day. I don't know how long I'll be blessed to be in that classroom, but I guarantee you the seed was planted as I was a student there, right? The seeds have always been planted, and it's every experience, every moment of adversity that allowed that to grow and to develop into what hopefully will become a tree that continues to bear more and more fruit. You see, helping students like that little guy over there walk into their purpose is what I am trying my best to do. And y'all, things might get a little weird because every once in a while you might find yourself in the hand of a bird <laughs> making a weird, quirky voice. But there will be children that will appreciate you for it. So what is it today that is holding you back? What seed has been planted that just needs a little bit of water, a little bit of fertilizer, you know, a bunch of rain, because there's plenty of it outside, that will allow you to grow and develop. It's time for you to be inspired to create and grow in whatever garden you're in. And I know that I expect to see a harvest. Thank you. Take my mic off, because it felt comfortable. I was going to keep it. Thank you, Adoria, very much. Um, I hope you get over your stage fright soon. <laughs> I want to know, I, I'm like, I learned two things. I want to be your friend, and will you be my life coach? So there we go. And also, your Brian spells his name right. So here we are. <laughs> I get brain all the time, which is ironic if you know me. It, so thank you. <laughs> the people that know me are laughing. That's fun. No, so, Thank you to our first set of speakers uh, for starting the morning off strong. Thank you, Adoria, for finishing that first batch strong. We are going to take a short 10-minute break and return. Um, that clock is not right, but I think, what were we at, 2.20? You come back at 2.30, is that right? So see everyone back in here at 2.30. Thank you very much. Well, welcome back. Uh, we're going to dive into the next presentations. I'm going to talk slowly just because, you know, internet is a thing. Um, but next up, Mark Koch, BSDE of 82, and Julie Koch Beinke, BSDE 82 as well, Uniting Design and Architecture for Social Impact. Mark Koch is a designer and brand strategist. He enjoys connecting people to brands, products, and organizations through enhanced engagement, trust, and user experience. To fulfill this, he co-founded Alternatives, a brand-building creative agency with his wife and partner, Julie Koch Beinke. Mark and Julie are entrepreneurs and have also founded a jewelry business, a graphic fashion company, an eyewear company, and a real estate investment company. Where do you find the energy? They've learned by doing through those experiences and that benefits their, uh, they've learned by doing through those experiences and that benefits their clients at Alternatives. They've developed patented and sold products that they've invented in a range of industries and served on the board of directors and board of advisors for several health and education nonprofit organizations. Do we have both Mark and Julie? Looks like we do. Great. Mark and Julie, the stage is yours. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. We're excited to be here with you today. Um, let me share my screen.
We'd like to share a recently completed project, the process that we went through to realize it, and some key takeaways that might be helpful should you decide to take on a similar challenge. It exemplified the importance of shifting the vision of good design from thinking as an individual to community thinking with a focus on impact for all. Here's a little background story about us. Julie and I both graduated from DAP in the 80s, me in industrial design and Julie in graphic design. We loved the beautiful modern objects and graphics that we'd seen in design magazines and we were fascinated with the idea of problem solving. We worked with for great designers like Massimo and Leila Vignelli, Fritz Gottschalk and Paul Rand. They designed so many beautiful things, but they were grounded in their personal vision of good design. Uh, and we loved working in that Bauhaus and Basel school style that they elevated, but sometimes their designs were not 100% aligned with the egalitarian and accessible solutions that clients were beginning to look for. Now our vision of what great design is has shifted. Thankfully, good design is everywhere, and we've seen an exciting positive shift that's accelerated in recent years. Great design has become much more than it was when we started. It's evolving from an emphasis on somewhat subjective aesthetics to design that is empathetic and accessible. Now design presents beautiful and functional solutions. It's become more inclusive of the people who are intimately affected by it. In the best scenarios, it's a participatory sport that brings many stakeholders together for incredible results. We've been fortunate to work with an amazing client in the strategic development and execution of a series of websites. What started out as an interesting project turned into a deep dive in formulating ways to build collaborative communities and create global platforms for social impact. Our clients exemplified community thinking and empathetic design. Clifford Curry, an architect, and Delight Stone, a historical archaeologist, are a husband and wife team who spent their careers focused on doing work for social good. Their thought leadership, starting in the 1970s, centered on pioneering successful senior housing, building communities that people would actually be happy living in rather than nursing homes. It revolutionized senior housing, and well over 3 million people have lived in their communities. They wanted to give back by encouraging more design professionals to create dignified, livable housing, incorporating the social principles they employed in their work. They created the Curry Stone Design Prize, which awarded and funded architects, designers, and planners who were engaged in making the world a better place through social impact design. They realized that the content that had been gathered over the years on the Curry Stone Design Prize website could be valuable to a much wider audience and the concepts and principles of an individual project could be applied anywhere. We worked with them to create a strategy for organizing the information and making it accessible to a larger audience. The Curry Stone Foundation website was created as a resource to make this work available to the growing community of social impact designers. They then created an architectural practice in partnership with one of the award winners, a brilliant young Indian architect named Sant Sanja Janardhan to address the needs of underserved communities in India. We worked together with Cliff Delight, Sanya, and her amazing team at Community Design Agency to create a website that tells their story to the communities they serve. A big part of their work is to get people, communities, and local governments involved in their projects so they can create sustainable change. They approach some of the most difficult problems communities face, such as slum rehabilitation, neighborhood regeneration, and dignified workspaces for some of the most disenfranchised groups, such as sex workers and e-waste recyclers, by democratizing access to architecture and design and involving communities in the process. The Curry Stone Foundation then joined together with a group of four incredible global architectural and educational networks to support their work in public interest design. They wanted to explore the idea of creating an online resource or network of networks called Design for the Common Good. We worked with the Global Networks and the Curry Stone Foundation to create a strategy of what this entity could be and should be and how it would operate and how the website could serve the global community. The work culminated in our design and launch of a website centered around the Global Design for the Common Good Conference and Exhibition in Denver, Colorado. It highlights the work that the members of the four global networks of designers, architects, and educators, and students 
are doing in the field of social impact and public interest design. It's an amazing, amazing show. The first hurdle that we had to overcome was in the work process. It required collaboration and collaboration and frequent meetings with stakeholders across the entire range of time zones, Portland, Denver, New York, London, Berlin, Mumbai, Singapore, and Taiwan. We were excited about the project and spent many long Zoom calls with the leaders of the networks discussing what the website could do to propel involvement in social impact and public interest design and raise visibility. The website offered an opportunity to link the four networks and unite them in their mission. Uh, on our calls, we brainstormed to create a format, a framework for something that could showcase the work being done and share how it was achieved to inspire others, inspire others to join the movement. Then we took a step forward. We realized that if the website could be more than, do more than showcase or portfolio work, it could actually be a living community and the global benefit could be significant. If like-minded designers, architects, and social activists, NGOs, local communities, had the ability to work together as a global community linked by shared values, they could amplify their efforts. It was a pretty novel idea. They could share ideas and insights, build projects together, and even make global friends, almost like Match.com for social impact. Uh, so many incredible social impact projects are underfunded and understaffed and need help on many levels. The hope is that design for the common good can be like crowdsourcing on many levels for social impact design. Our vision is, isn't just to showcase projects happening globally, but to share processes and learnings from individual projects that can help others with similar goals. It was decided to build a community that could be a living collaboration. We strategized, planned, designed, and developed the website, which launched prior to the conference almost a year ago. It features information about the conference, works developed by students and professionals, information about social impact design and the networks, and has a social component where participants can create groups and engage in open dialogue about topics around design for common good. On the social platform, students, educators, and professionals globally can connect, share ideas, plans, resources, advice, and encouragement. All of this has opened up a conduit for positive change that is already beginning to help people. These types of efforts are incredibly important to our collective future, but by no means easy. But as designers, we are uniquely equipped to embrace and empower change in everything we do. We believe that we have the responsibility and the obligation to play a part in empowering positive change, providing the communication tools and bridging the gaps that can bring communities together through our work. It's a privilege that we're very thankful for. Design for the Common Good is an emerging story and the global community is just starting to organically grow. Ideas are being built upon, experiences are being shared, and small communities have access and can benefit from global input from the best and brightest, or at least those who have done it before and learned something important that they're willing to share. The opening exhibition is now slated to travel globally with an upcoming exhibit in Budapest in the fall of 2023. And the four founding networks have their sights set on making this community a nonprofit organization. In the almost 40 years after founding of our office, we have seen that it all starts with people. People who listen, share, collaborate, and care are the most powerful forces of change. In designing for the real benefit of humans and the planet, community thinking is an inspirational force that allows us to do bigger things with greater impact. Here are a few of the things that we'd like to share that we learned on this journey. It was pretty profound. Uh, when the professions of design and architecture face urgent social issues, a change in thinking is required. The professional and academic process of design thinking or thinking about design is evolving to be an empathetic, inclusive collaboration of urgency that listens to and reacts to the stakeholders, communities, and people who are directly affected. Communities of people thinking together can have tremendous global impact but diverse teams making an impact together requires some structure, as you could imagine. Uh, working as part of this diverse global team, we learned together that establishing simple principles help the process stay on track. Um, and here are um, five principles that we hope can help you in your project. Number one, 
clearly define a shared vision at the start and stick to it. To make this work, ego must be suspended. Uh, some compromise by everyone, uh, must be made by everyone to reach the shared vision is required and leadership who will defend the vision must be put in place. Number two, clearly identify which team members will be responsible for the tasks needed to move the pro process forward. Responsibility isn't always fun, but people who are willing to accept it are crucial in reaching the goals. And number three, give everyone equal opportunities to participate. Participation and enthusiasm can dwindle quickly over time, especially when the team is not fully engaged. Identify and support those who are most engaged and remove any roadblocks that will hold them back. You always find the people who are, who are really care, and that's, those are the important ones to hang on to. Be decisive when decisions need to be made, set time limits for decisions, have a vote if necessary, and respect and support the decision of the majority. They are your village. And number five, it takes a village. Always be encouraging and supportive of each other. Positive energy fuels collaboration and positive, successful, rewarding results. Thank you. Sorry for all the uh, technical issues we've had here, but uh, we hope that it was, uh, some helped you all. This, everything's been amazing so far, and we wish we were there with you in person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark and Julie, for sticking with us uh, through, you, you know, that was ambitious. I wondered why at the beginning in your bio, you had so many side hustles, but now to hear that you're in New York, everybody in New York has a side hustle. I learned that. Thank you for, that was fascinating. And it's cool to see that University of Cincinnati, this place that I went to, has a global reach and a global impact, that that's something that started here. I, I think that's wonderful. So thank you for sharing. Absolutely. It was worth coming yeah. back. It's Lisa Bombach, BSDE 2012, A City Within a City, Enabling Innovation and Placemaking. Lisa K. Bombach is a design Bombach. I almost did it. Is a designer and educator based out of Seattle, Washington. As an experiential graphic designer who specializes in workplace and urban design, Lisa enhances interaction with physical spaces by integrating narratives and navigation cues into the environment. Whether working within the private or public sector, she aspires to build collaborative environments that promote discourse and build relationships. As an educator, Lisa has worked for over 10 years with young designers in both the secondary and collegiate levels who are being introduced to design methodology, technology, systems thinking, and professional practices. She holds a BS in graphic design and a minor in German studies from the University of Cincinnati and has also studied at, here we go, Hochschule für Gestaltung und Kunst in Basel, Switzerland. <laughs> while, at, while an SEGD CVG chapter co-chair, she co-founded the SEGD DAP student chapter and established a college-wide scholarship for students who exhibit excellence and experience design Please welcome to the stage, my good friend, Lisa Bombach. All right, thank you guys for having me. Let me find the screen button. There we go. Um, so during my freshman year here at DAP, one of my professors made a prediction about my career based on this project. And her remark really stood out to me because it was actually quite contrary to my own perception of my interest in 3D modeling. So here you can see my first ever 3D model. <laughs> um, she predicted that I would go into packaging design because I was good at thinking in three dimensions. And while I did not find my way into packaging design, I did gradually find my way into working in the three-dimensional space. Gradually being one of the key words, as is true of most designers in my field, I took a rather circuitous route to get there. Looking back, I see that I started my career out in the realm of being a graphic designer, focused on branding, storytelling, and clarity of information. I also developed a passion for community engagement. Now, my role challenges me beyond visual communications. I'm an experiential designer. To me, this means that I'm a curator of memorable experiences. It challenges me to tap into my inner artist, to leave an intangible impression on those who interact with the spaces I design. So how does one go about making a memorable experience? First, it's important to understand how memories are formed. Memory is formed in the brain through the combination of place, narrative, 
and emotion. In this presentation, I'm gonna share with you some projects from my career that leverage these three triggers to curate memory. Let's start with place. When I worked as an urban designer, I created everything from historical markers to wayfinding signage. In this example, I decided to mash the two concepts together in a pedestrian signage system designed to unify the city of Cincinnati's riverfront, central business district, and downtown adjacent neighborhoods. The wayfinding element is informative. It tells you where to go and how long it might take to get there. The historical image adds a layer of narrative, creating a relationship to the intersection and the people who experienced it before you. Overall, the design helps you remember your surroundings and thus your sense of place within the street grid. They reinforce one's mental map of the city, ultimately making it easier to navigate the next time you return. Gateway signage reinforces navigation just at a larger scale. However, I personally think that their most important function is to act as a symbol of the neighborhood it identifies. In this instance, the community of Evanston worked with Keep Cincinnati Beautiful to turn a vacant lot into an activated green space. While the sign itself is simple in design, it engages with its environment by linking the bold colors of an adjacent mural to the nearby pedestrian bridge. It also provides a trellis for the garden to reach skyward. The sign marks this place as a place of importance, welcoming visitors and making it a memorable destination. It identifies the neighborhood's aspirations to nurture growth and cultivate relationships. So next we'll discuss narrative. Narrative is a powerful tool for creating collective memories. And I often leverage it in workplace design to build a shared culture and mission. Within repetitive building layouts, narrative also becomes a powerful wayfinding tool as it can introduce a variety of experiences, creating a sense of place within a blank building canvas. In this example, the company for which I was working specialized in satellites and valued sustainability. We therefore built a narrative around the satellite's ability to see the Earth's beauty from above. The design celebrates the interconnectedness of the planet and our relationship with it. It also provokes reflection on the impact we have and our responsibility to care for our fragile planet. The resulting design uses a neighborhood strategy that applies a different palette to each zone. The experience becomes immersive. Here you start in orbit amongst the satellites in the lobby. Come on, here we go. Um, a metallic wall covering allows you to experience that perspective, shimmering like the light emitted from cities is seen from above. At the reception desk, we then designed a dramatic two-story sculpture with an integrated lighting element to introduce the sustainability narrative that features actual satellite parts that the employees in this facility work on. It acts as the exposition to the experience of the building, prompting employees to consider the environmental impact of what they put into our atmosphere as they conduct their daily work. The corridors then act as roadways, connecting workspaces to shared amenities and the first floor to the second. The main corridor places us in an urban environment where man-made refuse is reassembled as art in a gallery-like experience. In keeping with our client's mission, the installation was specified to use materials diverted from a landfill, like plastic bottles and fishing nets. Scannable technology informs the viewer of the company's initiatives and prompts employees to be conscious stewards of the planet in their day-to-day -day lives. Finally, Earth's beauty, which we aspire to share, cherish and protect, is visualized in collaboration spaces. These are axon views of scrum spaces. They house whiteboards, pinup surfaces, and casual seating where employees can work through ideas. Each scrum utilizes the same kit of parts, which we can adapt to a variety of architectural conditions. Here, the identities of the biomes are abstractly visualized through color, pattern, and texture. Their essence brings warmth and beauty to a relatively utilitarian workplace. Because of this, the scrums act as beacons that draw people together. They are critical to encouraging innovation and building relationships. Lastly, we'll tap into emotion. One of my favorite things about my job is that I get to collaborate with amazing artists. 
Not only does it bring me joy to work with creative individuals, but the impact of seeing something made by hand has a profound emotional effect on the viewer. When I've worked on projects with murals, the most common emotion I see people have is a feeling of awe. Scale, color, and content are just some of the tools we have as artists to inspire it. In this cathedral-like setting, a three-story mural, natural light, and a grand staircase all work in synchrony to make one pause and take the moment in. When we experience awe, we experience something greater than ourselves. Awe makes us shed our preconceived notions and opens up our mind to possibilities. As clinical psychologist David Elkin said, awe is a lightning bolt that marks in memory those moments when the doors of perception are cleansed. So all in all, memorable experiences are built on the foundation of place, narrative, and emotion. Whether we're designing a place of inspiration or a moment of respite, it's the combination of all of three of these elements all at once that experiential designers leverage to create visceral experiences that activate our senses and leave an intangible impression on our memories. They are places that we want to experience again and again in order to share the moment with others. While I found my way into this role via graphic design, I've been able to expand the horizons of my design practice into art, architecture, and planning. None of these projects you see on the screen would be successful without the collaboration of the team members, end users, and construction partners who brought their expertise and perspectives to the table, who challenged me to think beyond what I thought was possible, and continued to patiently support my 3D modeling endeavors. Through its capacity to build relationships, both during the design process and after project completion, experiential design has left an intangible mark on the lens through which I approach design and also on my personal life through the community I've gained along the way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa, for adapting quickly and jumping up for us. Fun fact about Lisa, um, she is a friend of mine. She loves random encounters with absolute strangers. <laughs> remember Paul? I remember Paul. That was a fun day. But anyway, so are we, are we ready? Uh, we're good to go? Sorry, he's running to the door for me. So thank you, Lisa. That was fascinating. A pleasure sitting at the same table with you. Hello. BSDE09, uh, Digital Design for the Future of Flight. Matt Lewis graduated from DAP Digital Design Program in 2009. Now he leads the user experience team at GE Aerospace, where he and his team design digital experiences that enable the future of flight. Previous to his role, he served as VP Experience Strategy for WPP's Rockfish, a top digital agency in the US that served the world's most forward-thinking companies. When Matt is not trying to solve problems with design thinking, he is wrestling with his four young children and volunteering his time with his family, parish, and schools. Please welcome to the stage, Matt Lewis. Start my timer, or I will talk forever. Um, so I, I met a few of you as I came up here, and uh, it, it, these presentations so far have reminded me that um, I was a outsider when I joined ADAP. I, I came because someone had recommended I go to DAP, but I didn't have any art school background. Um, I'm a very rational, logical thinker in a lot of ways, and these presentations today have reminded me that my craft is nowhere near the rest of yours. Um, so I've been only inspired. Um, but um, where I started um, in digital design and where I am now, I hope what you can see here is a sort of a glimpse into some of the less, and I'll call it less sexy, design of the world, but the scale by which the world exists. And I want to thank, um, actually, the blip in the technology there, because I think uh, Mark and Julie, going back to the seed, uh, what you guys just presented, I think, plays into my presentation quite well. Um, so um, we can go to the next, or I have to do this clicker. I'm used to other people clicking this for me. Um, so uh, GE Aerospace, um, it's interesting, we're in a bit of a change. People know GE, but if I ask you what GE makes, a lot of you will probably say light bulbs and refrigerators. Yeah, we don't make those anymore um, at all. Um, so uh, we are actually three companies that are currently in the process of separating. Um, in, uh, at the end of the year, we're gonna be uh, 
uh, a GE aerospace company, a GE healthcare company, and GE Vernova, which is power. And what we create are uh, jet engines, uh, the future of healthcare technologies, uh, so that we can, in fact, uh, move into the future of the best and the best of healthcare, and power. Uh, there's a large percentage of our nation that is powered by GE uh, through their grid. And it's um, something I guess I didn't know myself when I joined GE, coming into what was aviation is now aerospace. Um, but those three companies, this is our motto. Um, rise to the challenge of building a world that works. And this has always spoke to me. It did when I joined the company. And what I love about it is, as a designer, this is essentially what I'm always trying to do. I'm trying to make things work better. Um, my uh, first job, actually, I went in uh, as a more analytical, rational thinker, I was um, applying for a developer role. I didn't think I was a designer. I did not at all. And the job my hiring manager gave me was an experienced planner. I didn't know what that was. I had no idea. In fact, I didn't even know I accepted that. It was on my desk my first day. I looked at my paper. I was like, oh, I'm an experienced planner now. What does that mean? Um, and what she told me was my resume, the, well, the way I told my story was all connected. And she didn't see me as a designer, or sorry, a developer. What she saw me was as a systems thinker, someone who could connect the dots and tell a really cohesive story. And I go back to my time at DAP and just how much time we spent in the craft and those connections of the drawings to the, 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 the swatches and to everything. It was all about how do you bring that all together, right? So for me, Building a world that works, is, it's all about systems thinking. And in a world this large, you have to be able to do that at scale. You have to really be able to understand all the different components that are gonna be brought together. For us, we at GE Aerospace support, or rather, have, this is what we do. We build these engines. This engine's not even at scale. This engine would fill this room. These are enormous. Um, in fact, they talk about electric engines. If they did an electric engine, it would be made with at least 800 volts. If anyone knows anything about electricity, that's dangerous. Like, that's scary dangerous. Um, nobody wants to touch those. Um, in fact, the best I've heard that they've actually figured out is 2,000 volts, and that's impossible because that's an enormous battery. Like, you just can't do that kind of stuff. But these engines are huge. 65,000 engines in the sky. Divide that by two. That's how many planes we power. And those engines go on those planes, and they f are what keeps us safe when we're traveling. So that's the one thing about GEO Express I love is we lift people up and bring them home safely. Like that's our motto. Like the whole idea of like our job is to make sure that these things work really, really well and that we can all get home to our families, right? And we are very good at it. What's amazing about these machines is they are surrounded by sensors. There is hundreds of sensors sending data from the sky to our business all the time. What's really cool about that is, if anyone knows anything about data, data equals scale. You can do more if you have information. And for us, we've got 48,000 employees who create and protect and service those engines in support of our customers. That's a lot of people, and those people are all over the world. And so for me, I go, wow, that's a whole lot of data and a whole lot of people. I don't know what to do with that but I'm guessing there's a big system there. There's a lot of thinking that needs to go into place and we have to have systems of safety, of quality, of and delivery, because <laughs> our customers expect us to get them really good engines, right? And cost, everyone wants to save money at the end of the day, but they're expensive and we all have to be as efficient with cost as we can. But what's really great about these employees is depending on their role, they expect the best of digital design. Go back to my my degree. They cannot function without that data in their hands in a way that they can understand. And this is what's really cool. I think when um, I was in digital design, in fact, I think when I tell people I work at aerospace, they're like, I don't, I don't understand what you do. Um, in fact, it's easier now because I can say, I, well, I work for jet engines. <laughs> Before it was, well, I do marketing stuff. Uh, I spent 10 years in agency and I worked on websites. You know, it's like there was some great stuff there, but I felt like I was just, and people call it like black black design, like bad design, you know, forced UX, like I'm forcing people down a sales funnel to buy something that maybe they don't need. But here what I'm doing is I'm actually taking data and putting it into use in the hands of people who are going to do amazing things for our customers and the people in the sky. Um, my team supports the design of these applications that enable support, 
services, um, the maintenance of these engines, communications, alerts, notifications, other things that are required to make sure that everyone in the sky is safe and that when these engines are on the ground, we make sure that they're safe before they go back up. And those communications are with every airline, with every partner, um, so that you know we're following every legal, every compliance, and making sure that we have the best tools to be certain that we're safe. So for me, what's really cool is when I came to DAP, I was really challenged, like I said. I didn't have any art background. I did not have that portfolio of amazing design. And when I sat down with a lot of inspirational artists my first day in studio, I was not sure where this was going to go, but I stuck to it. I said, you know what? I was told this is an amazing school, and it was. Um, in fact, the best part for me was always the co-ops because the co-ops for me was like, well, what am I even going to use this for? What am I doing? Um, and I, I love that last presentation because it's there's a ton of business value in design these days. Like design is as much an art as it is a business, and we can use it to power the world. So for me, I have to sit at my desk at work and look at these design goals because this is what my partners care about. It's different. That's all I wanted to bring to the table today. Design in the global world of aerospace and what I do in my aviation job is different. But if you look at these, there's a lot of interesting, very human realities about every single one of these rules or these goals. Safer shops. We need to design shops that are not dangerous. We need to protect people. Decrease turnaround for transactions. That's just allowing people to have very simple days. Everybody I work with has a job. Can I come to work and know I can get my job done easily and I'm not going to be frustrated when I go home? I can go home to my family and know that I had a great day because all the processes just worked and I can turn things around in a reasonable amount of time? Or am I scratching my head wondering why can't I get anything done? You know, I can go through this whole list, but that's really the background here. It's, uh, we talked about retention on the previous presentation too, right? Like having our employees like what they do is hard enough. And the design of that is super critical to give them the best tools possible so they feel like they're empowered to make the right decisions in the right time for the safety of our customers. And so what I battle every day, and I wanted to bring this, as I mentioned, it's not sexy, but we struggle because we have multiple ways of designing in the business world. And we have different processes, different frameworks. But at the end of the day, what I love is we're all there for the same goal, the same outcome. So from these different processes, if you heard of them, lean is a process we're just focused on right now as business. It's how to identify waste in the process, make the process simpler, and we just focus on making the process better. It's a form of design. You're looking at systems, you're looking at tools, you're looking at people, how they work together, you're designing those things to be more efficient. Okay, My development teams use Agile. Agile is a two-week process where we're taking development cycles to make digital products better. And every two weeks, we feed it with user feedback or new features. And we're trying to make those tools better and better and better right? based on business goals and things like that. So how do you make the process better? How do you make the tools better? My job is the last one, which is my favorite thing, because I can come into any one of those rooms and say, you have to keep it human centered. We can't forget we're building this for people. Because at the end of the day, that's who we're trying to keep safe. And if our employees aren't comfortable in their jobs and can't get their job done right, or if our customers feel like we're giving them low quality products or services, they're not going to trust us to put our engines on those planes. And therefore, we're not going to have engines on the planes for you know, our customers to fly people around the world. So at the end of the day, this uh, aerospace business, it's really for our associates and our customers. It's for the people who get the work done. So for me, design is human, no matter what you're trying to improve. And even in this big world of aerospace where we just sell engines, well, we don't. We're actually trying to make the place, the world, a better place. So thank you. Thank you, Matt, very much. 
Um, it is weird to see that not all trajectories are linear. That seems to be a common theme today. Um, Lisa, you'll be a great package designer. But yeah, it, it's funny to see where we started and where we wind up and how that can, there's many multiple paths we can take. Welcome to the multiverse of design. So thank you, Matt. Um, up next, we have Heather Wilson. Uh, she has Design as a Civil Right, Centers for Architecture and the AIA. A native of Cincinnati, Ohio, Heather graduated from DAP in 2005. Heather has noted that the intensity of design school is an experience that shapes how I work for AIA. I understand the passion and dedication required to help translate ideas into the built environment. As the former director of programs and communications for one of the largest AIA chapters in the nation, AIA North Carolina, and as the EVP of AIA Utah, she gained valuable knowledge of the Institute and its goals for the membership. Heather is currently Executive VP CEO of the AIA of AIA Oregon. I don't know why I keep adding the to those, but thank you. Sorry, Heather. But yes, currently Executive VP CEO of AIA Oregon, Heather Wilson, the stage is yours. I can't hear you yet, so I don't know if you're muted. No, there I'm you muted. are. So, no, there we are. Perfect. And, and I'm moving my slides already, but that's okay. I'll get started. You saw the cover slide. So design as a civil right. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you for me being here. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I kind of like the previous presenter here came to DAC with little to no art background. I was convinced to go into the planning program because of my systems thinking and the way um, I could, you know, work the art part out <laughs> um, is what I was told. Um, and, you know, to greater or lesser extent, I pretty much did. I think actually I got pretty adept at it, um, especially as, you know, I was coming through class, a lot of it was digitized, but uh, with my BS in urban studies, and um, I did actually start with a AICP certification and worked in Parsons Transportation Group doing some engineering and transportation projects, um, which quite frankly, um, always ended in building a roadway, which wasn't always very creative or fulfilling to me. So when I got the opportunity to join AIA North Carolina and do some of this work, I really got into understanding what the history of the Institute was and um, where I could meet this group with my particular set of skills at their intersection of the built environment. So what I found was that there was really a lot of opportunity for me to work with these professionals who mainly, um, like many of you in the room probably, uh, as you're getting through the architecture program, just want to make the world a better, uh, more beautiful, livable uh, place with more equity and more comfort for more people, which that's not very hard to get behind. Um, so, it, you know, understanding where we started as AIA, the Octagon, um, which was built in 1858, was built by enslaved workers for Virginia's wealthiest, uh, by Virginia's wealthiest plantation family. And that was largely a, a gift to the United States Capitol for its establishment, uh, but it served to be a space for um, resilience, maybe our first uh, uh, built space of resilience where it kind of served as the white, it did serve as the White House after the 1814 burning of Washington and Civil War. So uh, this space uh, is where the Treaty of Ghent was signed. Um, it established the American Institute of Architects National Headquarters on site. Um, and a, I think I got the date wrong there. It's 1898 is when it was built. And it uh, restored one of the country's earliest you know, preservation projects kind of kicking off some conversation about why preservation might be important. Furthermore, this mark, you know, some of our integrations for economy, uh, understanding that, you know, rebuilding wasn't necessarily what AIA needed to do to serve its membership, and they could maybe set itself on a course of educating the public. Um, hopefully, maybe you guys, uh, as you go through your architectural uh, practices or journeys, you get a chance to visit the Octagon because it's owned by the Architects Foundation, and uh, this is what sits back behind it, um, which is the current headquarters. These were built in 1973 and again helped AIA engage in this civil discourse around in the middle of the Capitol. This is just blocks away from the White House. And, um, the structure was constructed on the outbuildings of that octagon, so some demolition had to occur, and represented the AIA shifting goals to both house staff for their growing organization. There were about 10,000 people uh, strong at this point, and also to influence design conversation, uh, building capital um, in the conversation around design by being in the capital, building something. 
Um, so we started to talk about energy and water resources, but also about design. This particular design is the result of a competition that launched in 1964 and was riddled with public conversation back and forth about brutalism, obviously. Um, and the U.S. Fine Arts Commission, which held this final approval in its hands for a very long time, in fact, did not arrest control of the design uh, until a new architect was uh, appointed, uh, the architect's collaborative, which softened the original brutalist uh, design offered up by Mitchell and uh, Giagora. And, um, you know, really, again, established this conversation with AIA as a, uh, both a resource, but as a, a stalwart um, defender of the democracy of designers to pra practice as they, sh they pleased on the edges of technology. So we see this transform into more spaces. Uh, we're now 95,000 people strong. Uh, in these images, you see uh, centers for architecture that include New York and Chicago, probably some of our most notable and, and most um, visitable. If you've not gone to the Chicago Architecture Center, that's not technically affiliated with the AIA chapter, but it's very closely related and staffed by and volunteered by many AIA Chicago members. Um, and through these spaces, what we're now finding are the opportunities to enlighten and engage the public, sharing and hopefully, you know, in, in engaging some young members, building a pipeline with uh, children and students who might be able to learn about why they and where they fit into the picture of becoming great designers in their cities, um, resonating the ideals that good design does make a difference. Um, I'll just show a couple of examples. This is one in North Carolina where I worked and was able to engage in the conversation. Uh, this also came about by means of a design competition. Um, it sits in the middle of a redevelopment district at the seat of the North Carolina legislature. And because of what I knew uh, from my planning background in DAP, I was able to help the chapter be the only ones to have a, a ground built, a growth built up from the ground center for architecture where they can both lease space and uh, share you know, ideas with the public. They always put their design awards out for everyone to view, but they can also do things like host weddings and uh, college graduation parties. Um, this also translated into the space where I worked in Utah. And I'll have to say this was the most collaborative um, effort that I was able to do. This is a historic Ford building in Salt Lake City next to the Rio Grande. Um, it has space for students as well as members uh, to host events. And again, the public is invited to join in the discourse. Um, it's, I think, a showcase of what the best ideals of design can do with access and open spaces, although it still has some kinks to work out with its public interface. You know, right outside of the windows is a very persistent and very serious homeless issue. Um, so, you know, while we discuss access, which like you see addressed here, there's like a three foot drop between the front entrance and the main floor, which was addressed through this um, articulated ramp. Um, I think we've got the opportunity to keep teaching the public why inclusion matters, why good design matters and how they can make a difference. Um, I think what I learned at DAP was how integrating these conversations will begin to do things like enlighten the future. And if I can leave you with a little bit of what that'll look like, returning to that first uh, building there, the, the AIA national headquarters are going to be refreshed. I'm gonna mute that because you don't need to hear it. It's just got some music behind it. Um, but we're gonna refresh these grounds that you just saw again in the evolution. And I think hopefully I've been a part of this conversation over time, I do now serve. Um, nationally on the Resilience Advisory Design Group for AIA National with uh, Emily Grandstaff Rice, who's the national president, and Kim Dowdell, who is president-elect. Um, and, and we are laser focused, quite frankly, along with Lakeisha Woods, who's the new CEO, on making sure that the spaces uh, become more open to the public, more telling of the story of not just where architecture is now, but where it's going and why that's so important to all of us. Uh, because if we can't you know, get this part right, I, quite frankly, and our buildings don't become more of a, a space of, of healing and, and hope, design as a, a civil right won't just be um, something that we're hoping for, it'll be something we quite frankly need to mandate because we all deserve clean air, clean water, and clean access to great spaces that invigorate and inspire. So thank you.
Heather, Heather, thank you very much for that. I was lucky enough to interview Lakeisha Woods recently, and it's a very interesting point in AIA's history that it's an all-female executive team at the national level, and Lakeisha also, as a woman of color, is the CEO of AIA. It's a really good time uh, to be a member of that group right now, so thank you. I've never been prouder of the organization. It's a great time. You're right. Thank you very much, Heather, and that was a wonderful presentation, so appreciate you staying with us. Um, up next, we have Mark Ryan, who I was lucky to sit next to at lunch. Uh, B. Ark from 1987, True North. Uh, he's present uh, presenting True North, a public art intervention. Mark believes in the experiential power of architecture. He believes that architecture can play a powerful role in the process of wellness and positive outcomes. His portfolio contains a diversity of award-winning projects that help reimagine how we work, learn, play, and engage in our communities. In addition to architecture and public art, Mark is passionate about education. Since 2004, he has been an adjunct professor at Arizona State University and University of Arizona, 2011 to 2014, teaching graduate and undergraduate design. Mark was the 2019 AIA Arizona Architects Medal recipient and elevated to AIA Fellowship in 2022. Mark received his initial training in architecture at University of Cincinnati, while also lettering in intercollegiate athletics, followed by graduate school at Architectural Association in London as a foundation scholar. After working in various parts of the USA and Europe, including 14 years in private practice, Mark joined Trainer HL, hey, that's my last name, but in its correct Gaelic spelling, in 2019 as a principal. Please welcome to the stage, Mark Ryan. This campfire on the edge of the water is inspired by the ancient Native American legend of the Great Spirit. Passed down through generations, it tells a story of the Great Spirit allotting guardianship of the basic elements of earth, wind, fire, and water, and assigning them a specific direction. Specifically for us, it was important that to north, the Great Spirit gave fire. For us, this manifests itself in three essential ideas, people, fire, and direction. Maybe. <laughs> in essence, for us, it's honoring those who have come before the mesmerizing beauty of a simple flame and the power of direction. Arizona's only been a state since 1912. But people have been rooted in this arid and dynamic landscape for thousands of years and provide a culturally rich and diverse history. This project is planted on the banks of the Rio Salado, the lifeline for this entire Sonoran Desert Valley. Hundreds of miles of initially hand dug canals by the earliest inhabitants have allowed this water to be dispersed and channeled to support agriculture and sustenance in this dynamic region and for a varied population. It's a reminder that water in the desert is precious and how integral this particular waterway is in allowing life to be sustained and celebrated in this environment. The balance of this, or the complement to this water of life is fire. Many of you are likely familiar with Gaston Bachelard's seminal book, The Poetics of Space. But on this project, we were completely captivated by his other book, The Psychoanalysis of Fire. Contemplating a flame perpetuates a primordial reverie. It separates us from the world and enlarges our world as dreamers. It's an expression of the potential and the power of the mesmerizing beauty of a simple flame. 
For Bachelard, the phenomenon of fire was situated at the crossroads of science and poetry, of the pragmatic and the poetic. Using the semicircular center of the Tempe Center for the Arts plan, a line was struck along the true north axis. This alignment emanates outward from the center and extends across the water through the foothills of the Papago Butte, Camelback Mountain, and beyond. Lining up the two flames viewed through a strategically placed aperture connects the individual to this greater perspective. Early walks on the site revealed something interesting, a bit of unexpected magic. The ground seemed to sparkle and blurring the focus on the camera lens, a photograph of this phenomenon thought about as a site-specific constellation was then mapped on the surface of a black concrete mass and determined both the size and the placement of 120 individually cast and illuminated resin rods. Suspended within each of these rods is some special aspect of the Performing Arts Center. Screenplays, sheet music, sketches from the process, materials collected from the site, critters, even, <laughs> even some nasty correspondence received from the city, but don't tell them we didn't let them in on that part. But it felt appropriate and important that actually everything should be included. People, fire, direction. Rooted in the long history of this particular place, a campfire on the edge of the water is inspired by the legend of the Great Spirit. It endeavors to make a meaningful connection with this time and this place, honoring those who have come before the mesmerizing beauty of a simple flame, the timeless enchantment of the night sky, the power of direction, and we hope a sense of wonder and intimacy in the world of dreamers.
<laughs> what a magnificent punctuation on an already exciting day. That was, uh, any, you could see the curiosity and just drawing people in like moths to a flame. There was, it was, there was a, something really beautiful about that. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you for closing us out and inspiring us with that, uh, with your talk and that video. Uh, it's another great DAPEX in the books, and I look forward to seeing where the work takes us next year. Um, that is, if Adoria hasn't taken over my job by then, which I would welcome you to do. I think you'd, be, I, I think you'd be good at that because that seems to happen in your life. You know what you'd be good at. Um, I want to extend my gratitude to everyone here today. Um, I want to thank Ellen for all the hard work she does behind the background to make this work. I'd like prestige entertainment in the booth. Thank you. Um, none of the, t you were magnificent. And if we could have one final round of applause, please, for all of our guest speakers, thank you for joining us. Thank you.